Good morning. Let me introduce myself. I'm Astrid Ajenjo. And it's a pleasure for me to introduce this first plenary session with these amazing speakers. First of all, I want to thank the local committee, Mayo, Susana, all of you, the amazing work you're doing to organize something as big as this. This takes a lot of hours. And uh, I'm sure that many of those hours you stole from not only your working hours, but also from your pleasure hours. So thank you. Thank you for welcoming us like this and for all this organizational work. So this plenary uh, session uh, with this, the idea is to mm, show the current economic uh, context uh, situation. We know it's complicated. There are crises, there are uh, geopolitical tensions. Uh, there are massive elements that overlap in one on top of another. We have uh, ecologic collapse, uh, geopolitical tensions, war, all sorts of conflicts with the energy crisis as a backdrop. Mm, we also see a crisis of globalization itself and the technological element as a battlefield and uh, an inflationary spiral which is asphyxiating everybody. We see a crisis of social reproduction, a crisis of care. So with this plenary, well, with the Congress as a whole, we're going to see what can the feminist economy say to all of this to, you know, with our theoretical uh, corpse and what we have to say politically as a road plan to guide us. So with this first uh, plenary, I mean, with the limited time we have uh, and the people we have, we're going to try and touch upon some of these subjects. We have four amazing speakers. Uh, something which is typical of this Congress. They're very much between an academic profile, social movements. I mean, it's going to be really rich and I'm sure they're going to inspire lots of questions on us. So I'll introduce you as you take the floor. Hang on, let me have a look at my notes. We start with Flora Partenio. Uh, on my right. She's a feminist activist, a lesbian. She comes from Buenos Aires in Argentina. She's a PhD from Buenos Aires, Argentina in social sciences. She forms part of DAWN, uh, Development Alternatives with Women for a New Era, a feminist uh, network from the Global South. She coordinates it for change and coordinates uh, the Feminist Economics uh, School together with Corina Rodriguez. She teaches uh, uh, in Argentina at uni various universities and her presentation is going to talk about the paradigm of austerity and uh, she's going to talk about the situation of the labor world, the connection of digitization, the corporate world, financiarization of life and all those opportun opportunities which come up with the digital revolution. So for this first framework, Flora, you have the floor. I'll let you know when you have one minute to go. Great. Thank you. Good morning. It's uh, great to have made it here. I want to thank the organizing committee, uh, uh, Mayo, Sara, uh, Susana, all of you who've worked hard to bring me here. I know it wasn't easy. And. First of all, I'd like to say three things before I move on to my main axis. First, um, I reached a feminist economy, or I came to look economy through feminist lenses, through dearly beloved sisters, women I love, who planted the seed. Amaya Teres Orozco, Cristina Carrozco, who's always there, and Corina Rodriguez from Argentina. Eh, 
I believe we are learning together and our reflections are part of that collective knowledge. I come from the south, from Argentina, from a country which is currently not just in a situation of deep debt, but also the crisis, as we heard in the initial panel, we are in a deep crisis, the global crisis, but also I come from a temperature of uh, 40 degrees plus in March, which shows how unsustainable this model is, which is also the dominant digital model. I also come from Argentina, which is the lithium triangle with Bolivia and Chile. Lithium, which is what is now called natural resources, and there is a resistance to call about uh, natural common goods. This struggle for lithium is one of those extractivist issues which is destroying our continent. So, Astrid was asking me to start. Well, we need to stand up against this dominant digital paradigm, saying that the current struggle, as we see it in other dimensions of the crisis, is against the hyper-concentration of digital power, the current geopolitical situation of digital power, which it concentrates, I mean, let me just give you some figures. If Amazon now concentrates some 50% of the cloud space, and our search engines, when we search something on internet, 64% is Google Chrome. That concentration of digital power talks to us about the level of discussion we are at and the level of disparity between the global north and the global south. And I mean, without going into internet, the seven main internet suppliers are in the north, the global north, particularly in the States where the head of the Southern Command, Richardson, was recently talking about the natural resources of Latin America as a target for their military geopolitical actions. So that fight leads to lives, leads to destroying territories, and that is how we look at digital geopolitics. In this uh, general diagnosis of the economic situation, we could say that we see a clear racist and patriarchal pact which combines digital capitalism with hyper-exploitation of the poorly paid and in precarious conditions in digital platforms. When we talk about this work, we talk about uh, a work which is highly feminized and full of migrant workers. You just need to have a look at the main platforms, the most visible ones, and also the platforms which work sort of inside the house, uh, online sales and the main platforms which currently sell products. So not just the most visible platforms, talking about logistics, uh, transport delivery and such. So in this pact that we see, there is a key element, which is how these platforms have grown thanks to this uh, financial dynamics, the idea of you know investment funds, what people call virtual venture capital, that has fed many digital platforms and which appear as intermediaries in the provision of services, but they never call their users uh, workers. And let me give you a special warning about how, in this situation, we see how things come together. Different forms of digitization, uh, the advance of corporate power, and the financiarization of life. What do I mean? Part, part of these digital platforms which offer services, which appear as intermediary in uh, job offers or as a possibility of generating an income, they are also generating dynamic of corporate cap capture of certain fields, which are very sensitive, very expensive, uh, such as care work. During the pandemic and immediately post-pandemic, what we're seeing is how care work, what they call paid housework is being uh, taken over by these applications. And they don't just generate this kind of job offers. 
Uh, let me tell you that they never call their workers workers. In fact, there's a scattering of labor rights. They are also generating dynamics which bring together social uh, the inclusion in those platforms with indebtedness dynamics. It, this, this is something that we see not just in applications for care work that provide uh, uh, for the workers' banking inclusion or credit inclusion, particularly in South America, but they are, we're also talking about riders, uh, Uber riders. Yeah, you're going to have a debt with the platform and you're going to have to pay to, to work in order to pay your debt. So there is this debt dynamics which uh, questions the possibility of generating an income. And we're seeing that in the uh, overlapping of the growth of this uh, digital platforms and uh, the financialization of life. Now, apart from this, I also wanted to talk about how we can stop this extractivist dynamic of uh, data and stand up for the emancipation promise of the digital world. And uh, I, I know that, uh, well, amongst some uh, Southern sisters, we set up uh, a struggle for um, digital uh, fairness, uh, a feminist digital fairness. I mean, how? We want to take back the public digital sphere when faced with a very adverse scenario, which is the dynamic of the hate speech, uh, racist speech, transphobic, uh, ableist. I mean, there is a lot to be done by us because we need to get back that sphere in the digital world as well, because that affects our physical life and that affects the value of democracy. I come from a region where democracy is seriously threatened. You just need to have a look at what happened recently with Brazil, with Bolsonaro, the expansion of ultra-conservative authoritarian regimes. And also on the other side, and let me bring my green handkerchief up because very near here in Polonia, because a sister went with somebody for an abortion, she's now being taken to court. There are these discourses against our bodies, against our achievements, against our rights. We're seeing that not just in the digital sphere, but also in the physical sphere. Another point, how can we respond to these violations of human rights and, and the rights of uh, defenders of the land, of the territory and of natural common goods? I think that there is an important initiative to fight that in all the spheres of the digital society, socialization. Another point, how can we think of decolonizing internet? This is something that has been much discussed. There are many pioneer feminist uh, initiatives here, but I'd like to mention the decolonization of data governance. What are we talking about in terms of regularization rules, uh, trade rules, and the treatment of intellectual property? During the pandemic, the big struggle was for vaccines. Even today, the distribution of vaccines and their patents, they're still there. The sacrosanct private property is still there in the case of knowledge. The example of vaccines was clear. How can we work on that and move it on to the generation of knowledge and intellectual property within technologies? But also talking about data gathering, who pays the highest uh, rates for internet in the global south are those who cannot gather data. So, and, and data control is specific, is cr crucial for life, things to do with education, with health, uh, social security, that lack of control of our data limits us. And also, I want to mention, and, and I know I only have one minute left, thank you. Um, I want to mention how we can uh, act on this narrative of uh, this neoliberal digital uh, cap or neoliberal capitalist digital world. We don't want that poisoned cake of 
neoliberal uh, world to access the digital world. We don't want a poisoned access of uh, women moving into the digital world, leaving out the trans uh, community. We don't want that poisoned cake. We, as an old newspaper used to say in Argentina, Voice of Women, it was an anarchist newspaper, we want to sit at the feast of life. We want to have a voice on that feast of life, not just have that poisoned cake. Thank you, sisters. Thank you very much for that, Florida. In just 10 minutes, it's very difficult to outline a framework as you did. That is very meritorious. We all face that challenge, and thank you very much for staying to the time allotted. We'll now hear from Tiziana Tedranova. I'd like to introduce her. She will speak to us in English. The organizers proposed that we make this exception, and Tiziana, I'm sure, will feel more comfortable being able to speak to us in English. She is a professor and researcher in digital media and politics at the University of Naples. She works on the effects of information technology on society through digital working and common goods, how to change the direction of the digital revolution from its maximum neoliberal expression to a more social feminist version, and the idea of the common property, common good as the main theme. Titiana, you have the floor. Thank you. I was thinking uh, speaking of uh, Italian, that would have been preferable, but we finally decided to give it to you in English. Cosa, cosa, cosa lascio a voi uh, la scelta? Italiano oppure inglese? In, in English, please, because we don't have an Italian okay. translation service. I speak in Italian, but I can, I can switch to English. I uh, prepared my talk in Italian, but I can, I can change it. <laughs> okay, uh, so thank you very much. Thank you for this invitation. Uh, I really appreciate it, and I'm sorry if I'm not able to be in Barcelona. Uh, there is, uh, there's been much traffic between Barcelona and Naples over the last uh, few years since Ada Colau's so administration. Uh, we had uh, many fruitful exchanges, uh, and I you know, really appreciate uh, uh, this Congress uh, and uh, the idea of a feminist economy is very important. So thank you very much for thinking of me uh, for this uh, conference. So just uh, a few days ago, two days ago, I was invited by a feminist uh, collective here in Naples uh, to speak about Donna Haraway's Cyborg Manifesto. The uh, Cyborg Manifesto was published uh, 40 years ago, and although uh, people talk about it uh, mostly in terms of the figure of the cyborg, uh, what is uh, not mentioned as much is the fact that uh, it was an intervention into feminist, socialist feminism. So it was about uh, also uh, a critique of the, what she called uh, the informatics of domination, uh, and what now we dis describe as the uh, digital economy. Uh, the Cyborg Manifesto, on the one hand, announced the end, uh, there was a 1980s, of a type of economy and society which was based on uh, binary oppositions such as public-private, uh, body and mind, work and uh, leisure, and which kept the women in the private space, the body space, uh, the space of uh, uh, the type of work, uh, which was centered around the body, uh, which was given no value as such. On the other hand, uh, the new digital uh, revolution, which was uh, already starting in the Silicon Valley, which is today at the center of this financial crisis, she uh, uh, suggested and absorbed women uh, in the new technological uh, circuit, 
making, uh, uh, spreading uh, the historical forms of uh, ethnicized and feminized labor, such as its vulnerability, precariousness, uh, uh, its gratuitous, unpaid nature, uh, the uh, request uh, for affective involvement, uh, uh, its request for personal care, uh, and the end of the distinction uh, between the time of work and the time of life. Since then, uh, internet has become the global infrastructure of the uh, digital uh, uh, economy. Uh, for the most uh, part, uh, uh, before uh, uh, the 2010s, uh, was associated with uh, a male domain, with uh, male kind of labor, uh, at least since uh, the term computer no longer refers to women who perform manually the operations necessary to make uh, uh, the big uh, electronic calculator uh, work. Uh, since the mid-2000, uh, the internet has been transformed into a complex of platform, corporate platforms, uh, incorporating a great amount of feminized and ethnicized labor, uh, such as data labor or the creation of content, uh, which has, uh, is fundamental for the functioning of digital capitalism. At the same time as this incorporation of uh, feminized uh, labor into the digital economy, it has uh, foreclosed the possibility to think about digital technology, technologies as part of the process of reinventing a feminist economy based on the centrality of care, cooperation and social reproduction with relation to the hegemony of competition, human capital and profit. Uh, what the Care Collective uh, in its uh, Care Manifesto published uh, after the uh, onset of the COVID crisis uh, called the economy of carelessness or the lack of care. In other words, the digital economy has been until this time expression of a neoliberal economy based on the theory of human capital, which is now uh, calculable in terms of number of followers and influence and on the primacy of competition with relation to cooperation. It has imposed and developed interfaces and kinds of connectivities of extractivist type, which are damaging uh, for uh, uh, the environment and for uh, subjectivity. In the 2010s, uh, a number of collectives uh, which were uh, um, inspired by postonomist uh, Marxism in Italy uh, have uh, uh, argued uh, and uh, formulated uh, um, in ways that have been uh, actively mobilizing the critiques of uh, feminist uh, political economists about uh, a type of economy based on social reproduction as a mode of production based in the common, or the notion of the common as mode of production. Uh, unlike the notion of the co digital commons, uh, the idea of the common as mode of production uh, would did not rely on the nature of information as a good or commodity, uh, that is, as a non-rival or abundant commodity, uh, but on the idea uh, that the forms of labor which have been traditionally considered uh, not productive of, of, of value, that is, uh, those that uh, are uh, part of the labor of social reproduction, uh, which constitute the new frontiers of accumulation. The idea of the common as mode of production was inspired by uh, feminist econ economics. Uh, Bueno, ¿sí? Okay, our next uh, presentation is also virtual. Would you mind taking the floor now? Excuse us for this technical glitch. These are things that happen. We will recover Tiziana for her to continue.
and also Mayo. But we will continue with this panel with our next face-to-face -face speaker, dear Rafaela. Rafa is, excuse me. And so we will continue with Rafa. Rafa Pimentel began working in feminist movements in the Dominican Republic and continued with that work in Spain, where she arrived in 1992. She's one of the faces of Territorio Domestico, a, an association for caregivers and domestic workers. She formed part of the March 8th Strike Committee in 2019, she is a professor at the Complutense University of, Ars of Madrid, and she's also the author of Biosyndicalismo from Territorios Domésticos, which was published in 2121. She will speak to us about the situation of domestic workers, caregivers, from a feminist viewpoint, and the experience of the struggle and battle for the rights of domestic workers in which she has been a clear leader. Rafaela, you may now take the floor. Thank you. Thank you very much for the invitation to speak to you, and good morning to one and all. I'm happy to see how these spaces are still being built. What has just happened represents one of the challenges that we have in feminism. We do the best with what we can. It wasn't my turn, but we're not going to lose the time that we have until we straighten out the technical issues. That is to say that we overcome any obstacle. And when we're among friends, it's important to have that spirit. Thank you to the Congress of Feminist Economy for inviting me once again for continue to opening doors to diversity and to give us the opportunity to meet at this space which is very important for us to continue to build to continue to discuss to continue to debate a number of issues that are still very much a reality thank you and i encourage you all to continue to work so that we can all be together sometimes it's difficult but we are blazing the trail and we must not lose our goal of being together, being all together, and also remembering that being all together involves other smaller processes where we are continuing to come together, and that's also very important. So I would like to say hello to all of our friends who have given us this opportunity to meet and be together here today. I would begin by speaking about a few of those great challenges that we face in feminist economy, and I would also like to acknowledge this opening process that we have had in the domestic workers and caregivers sector along those lines of feminist economy for us. When many of us came here, we found colleagues such as Maya and others who began to speak of a feminist economy and began to walk the path and attach value to those processes and knowledge that we also had. It's also important to mention this and to visualize this. The domestic workers sector is growing out of the feminist movement. It's been a great contribution that is being made. I'd like to begin discussing a few of the challenges that we face from the feminist movement and from feminism in general. I would begin with things that we've already heard about, everything that we've lived through and continue to live through in caregiving. It's that challenge that we face. The challenge is the conflict between of the sexual division of labor. That's a challenge that we face from feminism. And now it seems as if we have looked beyond that because we've gone from that space that we were in in recent times. Many women were in and many migrant women were in. Now that that space of caregiving and managing life has been left empty, other women have entered. We're still 
dealing with the issue of global change, global chains, and there's something that we have now looked beyond. It's about men, how they are taking responsibility, and they are in this movement that women have been in, and how many of us are just uh, settling for help. The so-called help that men give us, but they say that they help out at home. It's not a matter of helping out. It's a matter of taking an active role in life management for everyone. That is a challenge that feminism has to face that issue, that men don't just take responsibility for management issues and housework, that men are not doing this. Women are still doing it in conditions that are very complex. We can see how during the pandemic when schools were closed and our children had to stay home and many women were teleworking as well, if they could. They were teleworking with kids everywhere and still managing the household. It was a clear example of how this conflict has not been resolved. And we also said, if men had been involved in the management of life and the management of caregiving, we may have progressed a bit more by now because it's the women who are still demanding job rights and life management rights and we're still discussing and arguing about who is going to take care of our parents and who's going to take care of our children. Or, as we say from feminist economy when we discuss this issue, who's going to run the washing machine? Who's going to load it and empty it? We're still arguing about who's going to do this. So the great challenge that we face in feminism is how to face this sexual division of labor. It seems that we have left that by the wayside. Another matter are the inequalities that we face in society itself. We also say that until situations such as the right to dignified housing, the right to education, the right to proper health care, until these things are resolved, and until we determine what kind of care we must give and who must give it, because we speak a lot about the state has to take uh, cards in this matter, and we know that. But what kind of care are we really talking about? Because we also have to face this, and it is also a challenge, because we can't demand that the state give us the care, care, which lately we've said is public, community-centered, dignified care, but not all care. What kind of care is the state going to give us when, during the pandemic, we have what we have from the state and how the state managed nursing homes. What kind of care can we demand from the state to see if that right to receive care, who's going to have it? Will the people who have the money continue to benefit? Will they continue to benefit from that care when they're really not uh, taking into consideration the lives of the people who give that care? These are the challenges. We must define clearly what we mean when we talk about care. What is it going to consist of? And if there are unresolved issues, such as those rights to those living conditions and those rights of housing, education, and health care. What's going on with all of this privatization that we're seeing? This is one of the biggest challenges that we must face. Because with so-called life management, women are the ones responsible for that life management. We are the ones who are given the responsibility of managing the lives of others. And we 
are educating ourselves on how to do that in a dignified way, but that is taking its toll on our lives and on our bodies, because we are the ones there on the front line. So one of the main challenges that we must overcome, and one that we've left by the wayside, is this sexual or gender-based division of labor. Another challenge that we face from feminisms is that of employment agencies, which are now transforming into platforms. This is a huge problem. Everything that we are achieving in terms of rights, of labor, job rights, and we are saying time and again that these jobs are the jobs that make life possible, but we're still fighting to have them considered as proper jobs. Even with that fight going on, we are transforming this struggle through digitalization as it is moving onto platforms. The result is that people's lives are being digitalized and caregiving and domestic work. We already saw what happened during the pandemic. Those who had to give that care, women. We had to go out and give that care, exposing our bodies at the risk of getting ill ourselves, at the risk of being harassed by the police because we didn't have the right sort of permit, because we were in the state of alarm. Even so, we were the ones on the front line. So now, what's the problem with platforms? It's because it is like a silent figure that is now in this area. And we will come to a day in which domestic workers or caregivers can be called to work for just half an hour through Amazon, through Globo. And what the hell is going to happen to us then? What's going to happen to our lives? And now I'm being warned to finish up, but it's very difficult. I would finish up going back to those challenges that we have and that we speak about, because I believe that we're doing a great deal and we know it. But the challenges, we've had to put them by the wayside because of the reality of our daily lives and the difficulties in managing our lives and then managing others' lives, as women do. We simply have not had enough time to deal with these conflicts, to deal with these disputes, and to truly present a challenge to this capitalist, racist, sexist society. Thank you. Thank you and Rafa for being so good with time management. I'm awful at that. Can we get Tiziana back? I can see Yayo. Uh, now, here. Yes. Uh, whenever you want. Digital revolution uh, in the public Italian universities uh, is still uh, quite uh, behind. Okay, so, <laughs> sorry about that. So I'm now connecting from my mobile phone. I'm in my office at the University of Naples. So, you know, what I was saying uh, was that, uh, that there's been this debate where uh, kind of uh, this Italian Marxist post workerist tradition, which always had this uh, strong feminist, uh, you know, this feminist uh, economy critique of uh, the Marxist theory of labor associated with Silvia Federici, has actually, uh, you know, brought to the center again the idea of the common as a mode of, of production, which, inspired by feminism, considers the idea uh, that what used to be uh, thought of as uh, activities which are not really productive of value, uh, such as taking care of children, you know, what uh, was referred to before as a sexual division of labor, uh, taking care of children, old people, uh, 
uh, the, the ill, uh, plants, animals, human as a not humans, to teach, uh, to nurture, and nourish, to take care of, to create and sustain relationships, uh, can only be financed only after the real economy has produced value. So now the idea is that these uh, are the uh, main activities that produce the wealth of a society. And this is the wealth which uh, expressed itself in the growth of the capacity, as Haraway put it, of staying with the problems. So the problems of uh, the uh, climatic crisis, uh, this mass extinction of species, uh, uh, inequalities, uh, uh, global migration, uh, uh, you know, all, all the problems that keep piling up uh, uh, in this kind of economy. So the value of the idea that it is possible to think about an economy that is centered uh, around what is to be thought of as social reproduction is that, you know, it ends, uh, it aims to end with the sexual division of labor and considering uh, uh, social reproduction not as a kind of mindless uh, uh, mind, you know, body labor, but something that, as it is historical done, uh, always implies a continuous process of elaboration, experimentation, research, and uh, uh, social participation. So the so-called uh, digital revolution has a potential to increase uh, uh, the cooperative and inventive character of uh, social reproduction, but at the same time, uh, as it was uh, said before by Flora, again, uh, at the moment is in fact monopolized by a restricted number of companies, uh, which uh, are uh, regularly producing uh, uh, financial crises uh, such as we are witnessing now. So one of the problems of uh, the digital economy uh, is also, uh, it's been a kind of technological monoculture so there has been an argument that has been around the philosophy of technology, uh, so technological monoculture, monocultura technologica. Uh, so it's been argued that we should look for different uh, concepts of technology and mythos of technology in different cultures. But I think that we can look for technodiversity also in uh, uh, social practices of oppositional resistance uh, to technological monocultures. Uh, uh, over the years, uh, I have witnessed uh, many uh, attempts uh, to uh, design uh, uh, software, uh, hardware, uh, so uh, artificial intelligences which are actually grown in neighborhoods, in multi-ethnic neighborhoods, which can learn different languages and help to create uh, community uh, data commons, uh, which can be used in project of environmental assessment of uh, 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 pollution and its uh, uh, toxic waste and damages uh, which has struck women's health, particularly a democratic uh, uh, platform for decision making, uh, such as the one tried in Barcelona. Uh, common coins, so uh, blockchain based uh, currencies which reward uh, uh, cooperative labor, uh, distributed digital archives uh, which can help to construct. Uh, historical memory to struggle, uh, uh, such as developed here in Naples, uh, or rural mesh networks in Greece, for example. So these are the basis, uh, you know, contain uh, uh, ideas for a different kind of economy and society. Uh, they were generated by artistic or activist uh, uh, environment, and they remain as examples of other possible worlds uh, which have been abandoned uh, by short-term investment, which uh, are strikingly uh, compared to the capacity of financial capital in the 2010s to invest in long-term sustaining significant losses uh, uh, in order to establish uh, uh, you know, a capitalist co competitive model of technology against uh, their alternative. Uh, so they have made social innovation completely subaltern to the market rather than the primary force of change. So it is necessary that this uh, digital technodiversity uh, that exists uh, is uh, sustained by and integrated into a uh, different idea of economy, such as a feminist economy, which uh, has the power to govern the choices uh, uh, of technological development uh, with the same power that uh, neoliberal uh, political economies has had over the years. So I would like to suggest that the challenge of a feminist approach to the digital economy is to think how it could be unbound 
from the impeditive to monetize, which uh, dominate it and uh, reconnect it to an economy based on social reproduction uh, in order to become the infrastructure of a new main mode of production based in the common, uh, rather than the accelerated of uh, an economic model that is ever more unsustainable and dangerous. Thank you. Thank you very much, Tiziana, for that presentation. Despite the interruption, we're doing very well on time. We will continue with Yayo Edrero, who I cannot see. Now I can. And Yayo, I'm sure everyone who's here knows her. But I'll give a brief presentation. She's an anthropologist, agriculture engineer. She works in a social cooperative for fair social transformation and ecofeminism under the sustainability and life umbrella, working in communication media, doing a wonderful job with the dissemination and publication. She will speak about the eco-social crisis, the increase in environmental inequality, the need for fair eco-social transformation and what that means, and the proposals and cautions from feminism. Thank you, Yayo. We look forward to hearing from you. Hello and good morning to everyone listening. I am very sorry I can't be there with you in person to share this space and to be able to touch each other, but it's a pleasure to speak to you and especially those of us who are responsible for organizing things and keeping things in order, as in my case I know I've not been easy and there have been many headaches. Anyway, I'd like to discuss a few issues that complement a few of the things that have already been brought up. So I'll try not to be repetitive, but I would like to add to some of the things that have been mentioned. I really uh, liked it when Isabella Stinger says that we are living through a moment that she defines as ones of intrusion Gaia's intrusion, that is the number of complications and problems that arise from this disruption in our economic metabolism, especially in rich economies and our lives, have made for a natural disruption and something that no one could have seen coming. Nature problematizing an element that is now a true part of the problem that we must truly take into account in the form of climate change, of aggressive extraction, heat waves, many ways that form part of politics. And it's a political agent that cannot be negotiated with. It's important to remember this because it defines a context one of translimitation, the physical limits of the planet, and the results, the consequence of generating economic, capitalist, industrialized, globalized, imposed violent models that have broken the bonds, have upset the biophysical balances that have been working for the thousand, past thousands and thousands of years. It's important to remember this as it's a context that can be stopped if we attempt to truly stop unbridled capitalism. But there's another part of it that is here to stay and that we have to take into account. The most complex part is that which comes from the alteration in ecosystems, what we refer to as climate change, changes in the water cycle, the alterations in basic processes, which are also our common property, the processes of nature. All of this leads to unforeseeable outcomes 
and the context that we live in will therefore be plagued, according to the scientific community, by things such as the pandemic, by mass forest fires, as we've just seen in Chile, or heat waves that not only will force us to think of refuges from heat or heat shelters, but can also disrupt agricultural production and other basic foodstuff production systems and many other things. Therefore, it is enormous an enormous challenge from the economic standpoint and the feminist economic standpoint and considering that we must organize our life together in a time in which we know that these things are going to happen. This is one first element I would like to bring up. Then a more mechanistic or fundamental aspect has to do with the decline in mineral-based energy, which is leading to a massive intensification of extraction activity that have been typical of colonizing societies and capitalism from the very beginning. This intensification of extraction activity, mining, is occurring just when the economy is beginning to transform into something greener. As Flora brought up, the issue of lithium, which is a key issue, but it's not just lithium, but platinum and many other rare earth minerals that as we attempt to live, stop living off petroleum and one based on renewable energies, it means going from a petroleum-based economy to one based on the rest of these other minerals that are considered commodities, and they're not exactly common goods. The European Union agenda, but not just the European Union agenda, the Green New Deal of the U.S. and other countries, other rich economies, have three main columns. One, transition to renewable energies, and to do so, you have to build solar panels and aero generators that require a vast amount of minerals. Another is electrical automobiles. And again, electric automobiles are not built out of thin air. They require these minerals as well. And the third pillar is the digital revolution, expanding the digital economy, which also requires for this to happen. It requires the manufacture of computers, cabling, fiber optics, mobile phones, screens, all of these things require enormous amounts of minerals as well. As a result, if you look at what these capitalistic green agendas are attempting to do and compare this to the reserves, if you say it in an anthropomorphic way, uh, it simply doesn't make sense, or it only makes sense for a very small segment of the planet that is still privileged enough to be supported by economic, political, and military power who aspire to maintain wasteful, impossible lifestyles in biophysical terms at the expense of the precarization and conversion of many of the world's territories into mere areas to be exploited, sacrificed, the lives of people there become lives of resistance as they attempt to defend their territory and aspire to maintain their lifestyle as they wish to do. I would also like to say that this issue, which has a very clear impact on the countries of the southern, of the global south, is also beginning to have an impact in the economies of the so-called developed world. In Spain, recently, there's been a discovery of the so-called empty Spain. Suddenly, those in power have discovered that there's a vast territory of this country that is empty and therefore can be exploited. Also in the service of this supposed green revolution, if you want to call it that, we're not talking about the arrival of projects that are violently imposed hierarchically imposed macro farms, massive wind farms without planning, or the conversion of territories into 
theme parks for tourism. This is all done under the philosophy that we must regenerate a network of life that supposedly did not exist before, and therefore we have to industrially manufacture it. This is something that we are facing now and that is generating a great amount of conflict. I would conclude by proposing that feminist economy is more important than ever. Why? Because of sustainability. First, and I won't speak at length about this because I think we all have a clear idea of it, but we are contrasting this against the common logic of the market. That is that anything can be sacrificed in the name of economic growth. But I would like to speak more from a standpoint of optimism and speak of sustainability. A sustainable outlook appeals to the awareness that we belong to part of a greater whole of life and focuses also on interdependence and that each life human and non-human life is entirely vulnerable and entirely necessary and this is key because we're hearing a number of messages also from the world of ecology and green economies with very good intentions but they talk about the need to sustain life but they're actually referring to sustaining life on the whole as an ecologist I defend this I advocate this but in terms of sustainability and feminist economy we must realize that it's a matter of supporting life on the whole and specific private lives must be dignified, must be well lived. If not, we will fall into the idea of acting urgently to save the ecosystems, but that should not keep us, that will not allow us to prevent the loss of life in the Strait of Gibraltar or exploitive factory ships or domestic workers who work for low pay in bad conditions so that others can have a dignified life. And I think we do run the risk of putting forth an ultimate cause of preventing these problems, but without looking into the other corollary problems. So a transformation, to be fair, from our standpoint, must be a transition that prioritizes the dignified living conditions for everyone that must guarantee the rights to meet the needs of life and it's all being done with the awareness that's being done on a planet that is in a period of contraction that is facing so many structural systemic problems and that must support and uh, be the basis for all future human life. That is the challenge that we face. And now the feminist economy with that outlook of the sustainability of life is absolutely key, is absolutely crucial. If not, we may find greater causes that cover up things like precariousness, subordination, the more vulnerable people in society if they are not seen from this intersectional outlook. So I would conclude my remarks here. Thank you for listening. Thank you so much, Yayo, for your comments and also for your impeccable time management. Now, we have half an hour for questions, comments, queries, because uh, uh, the, the program is going to shift uh, half hour back. So, you know, everything is going to be half hour late. The coffee break is going to be at half past 12. So we have until half past 12. From lunch on, we'll be back on schedule. Now, all the these uh, questions and comments will be part of the notes taken that will be shared on Saturday, okay, just for everybody to know. So without further ado, uh, the floor is open for anybody. 
Yep. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Yeah, if you want, yeah, could you raise your hands so that we can give you a microphone? Excellent. So far, we have three questions or comments. We'll have those three first. Okay. Yes, please, Antonia. Yeah, I'm Antonia Avalos. I'm from Mexico. I come from the Dahlia Fund. First of all, I'd like to congratulate you on this amazing Congress. It is essential, it is fundamental, it is urgent to put life, uh, love, uh, sustainability at the core, not just in fine words and speeches. I want to thank everybody, particularly Yayo, because her proposal to make it important to guarantee dignified conditions for all women, for migrant women, for nature, that balance, uh, and not just to give priority to an economy that profits from uh, the body and the lives of women, and particularly migrant women. Well, I, I really appreciated that. Thank you, Yayo. And I'd say that for people from the South, those of us who are struggling every day to sustain society, for those of us, the glass ceiling is irrelevant. It, you know, that is nothing to do with most of women's life. So we are struggling, as Yayo said, for that idea, a dignified light, dignified life for everybody. I want to congratulate my darling Pimentel and Flora for what they said about how the digitization of life and the algorithm, uh, they can choose for the better or worse, usually for worse, for the life of women. That is something that needs to be tackled and only from an engaged uh, cross-cutting feminist will we be able to question all these platforms and the digitization of life, which is rendering us in thunder and destroying us. For example, uh, artificial intelligence, uh, it makes us migrant women more likely to be detained or arrested in the UK. They take your mobile away and they take your data, they extract your data. There is a database from all those people without documents, without legal documents, and they are taken somewhere so that, you know, if you turn up wherever, they've got your pictures, you've got your uh, fingerprints. I mean, there's a lot of illegal things going on, things that go against human rights. So thank you for your words on digitization. We need digitization with a feminist outlook, or with a cross-cutting feminist approach, and also looking after the life of dogs, cats, nature, rivers. I love you all. That's it. Thank you. Good morning, all. And I want to thank the organization. I know they worked a lot. And I want to thank the uh, initial speakers. Uh, going back to what we've just heard, I want to mention how it is important to insist on the fact that this patriarchal, racist, uh, uh, capitalism has this uh, sexual division of labor. And as Rafael was saying, and Yayo as well, that is something that we keep avoiding when we have an analysis from an feminist, feminist economy. The bodies which are at the basis of, of all of that are migrant racialized bodies. And what we've heard about the new economies of pillage in the rural areas, the people who are working there, the migrant bodies, the racialized bodies in macro farms, they are migrant bodies. The new platform economy uh, riders, they are all racialized migrant bodies. And there's something which is concerning. Whenever we keep talking about this general idea of sustaining life, I don't think, I think we need to say what life we're talking about, what bodies we're talking about, because the bodies that are underpinning this racialized capitalism are racialized migrant bodies. And when it comes to looking into the 
the pillars of life, let's have a look at what pillars and what lives. I think this is something we need to have at the core of our discussions that we're going to have over the next three days so that we stop reproducing a white feminist economy. Yeah, we have a couple of contributions. Good morning. Um, Marcela, I'm dead nervous. It is the first time I attend a Congress like this. So thank you for the invitation. Thank you, Oxford, Oxfam, for allowing us to make it here. I'm part of an association, IPIG, from Valencia, Intercultural Association of uh, House Workers. I am a house worker, a domestic worker. So let me stress this. I'm a house worker because I think that most of us from coming from that field agree that the term domestic worker is not something we like because I mean for me domestic worker is like you know there's wild animals and domestic animals no thank you I'd rather be called a house worker or a care worker because that's what we do I've got Amaya here uh, recently since I'm part of the uh, management of big I'm becoming aware of how important the femi feminist economics is and um, I think it's very important to lay stress on the term care because it's like a whole circle you know everything comes from that what we do to care for life now who is doing all that caring who is allowing all of that to to go on, you know, you leave home and you go and do your job and you do your struggle and you are letting somebody else care for the lives you created. Apologies, this always happens to me. I just go blank. Sorry, it's gone. Gone, gone. You can come back later, don't worry. We've got somebody else here. Good morning. Let me not turn my back on most of you. First of all, my name is Malika. I come from the same association. It is the Intercultural Association of House and Care Workers in Valencia. I'm also very grateful for your invitation. I'm very grateful to Oxfam because they always give us this invitation to be included because we tend to be excluded, individual, uh, invisibilized in most fields. But Oxfam gives us this opportunity, the pleasure of being here with you. Listening to you, there are many things that strike me. One of them is when you talk about um, achievements. Yeah, there are achievements. But often I wonder, you know, how, how come some achieved, others didn't? In our industry, to, to be fair, I must say that, yeah, over the last 20 years. Those of us who are now taking over are migrant women, impoverished women, women who have been turned invisible, who taken over after the invisible, impoverished Spanish woman, because it must be said, it's history. They started the struggle. We're just taking over now. They lift all that hardship we are taking over now. Now, Rafa was talking about care, care work. I'd like to know when we talk about caring, caring for whom? Because uh, I'm, I'm caring other people, but when I need to be taken care of, will the system care for me? Will the people I care for, will they take care of me? I am on, I'm off sick for the last three years. And so far I have no diagnosis first. 
And then also uncertainty is just destroying my life and my body because I don't really know whether I have any rights in a country where I've been working for 25 years, given it my life. I worked for 16 years uh, working uh, and living with a family. And if you've ever been, you know, living help, you know what I'm talking about. That means that you work 24 hours a day at somebody else's house. And you might think 24 hours a day working, oh, that's an exaggeration. I am not exaggerating. It's very rare that somebody talks about our rights. We know we have duties. We know we have obligations. It's very rare, however, that we know we have rights. And if you don't know your rights, you are eaten alive by people without empathy who don't put themselves in our shoes. I worked there for 16 years. I, 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 I couldn't go out. Over those 16 years, I had many depressions. I was never really aware of it. I started waking up when I left that position as living help. And that's when I found out at least the country I was living in. Because for 16 years, um, I was living in a place where, where, whose language I couldn't speak. I mean, not that I speak brilliant Spanish now, but at least you can understand me. So I worked for those 16 years because I need to survive. And I was living with a French speaking family. So. For 16 years, I lived like a parallel reality in Spain. I didn't know what was happening. I didn't know the, the laws of the country. I didn't know my rights. So very often people talk about care and care work. I'd like to have more clarity on that. OK, you give me A, I give you B. OK, let's talk about care, because if tomorrow we fall sick, if our bones, visible and invisible bones, break, who is going to care for those of us who are giving our life, Spanish and non-Spanish people? Because we don't just care for, you know, the elderly. We care for their children, their plants, their animals, their houses. Let's define care. I would like to see that definition. Now, about what our sister said, uh, apologies, I know I'm, I'm taking up too much of your time, but I just want to mention this because often it is said, why don't we take the, all those migrants and fill that empty Spain? That's another way of discriminating and making migrant invisible. Thank you. We do have more requests. Would anyone like to speak to those remarks? Or should we just keep uh, hearing from the audience or anyone who is connected online? If you would like to take the floor, please uh, feel free to do so. We need the microphone to hear the speaker. Florida, your opinion is that now the CSV, the Commission of Social and Legal Status of Women of the UN, is being held right now on women and technology. Could you give us your opinion on the documents that they are working with and their goals? Over here to the right, we had a hand. I will be very brief. Hello and good morning. I'd like to thank you for providing this space for our meeting. 
as we face the challenges and heard from Raphael as well, it's something that is more and more difficult to generate spaces to meet, especially with our work realities. Also, Rafaela spoke very eloquently about the challenges of being a woman and working in feminized sectors and also the uberization to work in highly masculinized sectors. As a writer, in my case, we do face those challenges. Also, as Florida has said about data, all of these data that we generate, we don't know what they are. We don't know what value they have. We don't even know how to access them in all of these processes of exploitation and extraction and mining are just being accelerated by this vast amount of data. And I was excited to see Antonia and other colleagues because this excitement came from other times that we've met, thanks to the colleagues at Laboratoria, generating spaces, talking about the feminist trade union movement, the trade union movement in general, the challenges that come with that when we face the issue of data. It's very important, especially when we talk about all of these challenges, to focus very carefully on trade unions. That is where we are on the front lines of self-organization, sharing, knowing each other, and building the bonds necessary to work as high-risk activists. Thank you. We have a request there from the back. I can't see very well who it is. Yes? Hello and good morning. Can everyone hear? Good morning to one and all. My name is Begonia. I'm from Mexico City, a place where daily life is complicated enough. I am the daughter of a home caregiver and a cooperative member, the WAMB Social that I belong to has made it possible for me to be here. Everything that we've heard has been very interesting, especially regarding the urgency that is leading us to this level of activism that uh, makes us reflect on care for the environment and how in many places where I work, uh, such as southern Mexico, has led to territorial exfoliation affecting not only people's individual lives but those of entire communities. And there is a lot of work being done for conservation but also a lot of capitalistic uh, interests, NGOs, that we've heard about here. So we want to decry that situation and report it here for you. And from the time that I've been in Spain, I can say that sustainability is usually associated with matters of business, entrepreneurs, but we must also pay closer attention to that from a more holistic standpoint. So thank you, and I wish you the very best in these debates, and I hope that they are very rich and fruitful. Okay, down here. Hello, good morning. I'd like to ask the panel, and especially the panelist, Rafa, talking about sustainability in life, talking about dignification, talking about caregiving, without talking about the migratory policy that extends a policy of exfoliation and death, comes up a bit short. How could you speak about caregiving, foreign citizens' law, and our access to the rights for digitalization, uh, setting appointments, claiming our migrants' rights like that. Rafaela, if you would please uh, speak to us a bit about that. Mayo. I'd like to underscore what Titiana said about the proposal for the framework of digital commons 
as a possibility to rethink and go beyond this monocrop, uh, cultural monocrop of just accelerating digitalized capitalism with another proposal through digital commons. And Federici has brought us a concept of commons that does connect with feminism, but the history of digital commons has had very little connection with feminisms. In fact, in the practical aspect of free software and Wikipedia, they work very poorly in terms of gender inclusion and have very sexist dynamics. So if you could uh, expand a bit on that, Florida, Tiziana, how the digital commons can be feminist, because if not, it won't be common enough. How can digital feminism reorient that whole topic? And one final remark, and then we will close. We have someone over there to my left. Okay, I remembered what I was going to say. I saw in the program something very interesting talking about the professional sector. I believe that we are already professionals. Most of us are. And for other jobs, you have to have some sort of degree or a permit. And you know how hard it is to get a job without prior experience. But we are required to have the prior experience just because we're women, even if we don't have the actual experience. Often we don't have the experience and we have to learn as we work. We may not have degrees, but we are professionals. And it's a totally feminized, or at least on a majority basis, it's a totally feminized sector, according to surveys. Almost all of us are women who did this work. It's also racialized. Most of us are migrants those of us who do this, in a country that sustains the poorly named welfare state because of its condition. We've heard how the sector of caregiving as an internal employee, as an in-house employee, is like a form of modern slavery, a completely patriarchal society. I won't Reiterate, reiterate how most of us are women and work in a very impoverished sector because they don't attach the value that it truly has. It's taken for granted that you can pay little for this work. It's one of the most essential jobs. It's just one of the ones that sustains the world. And as my colleague said, it's important to remember the Foreign Citizens Act. That's what is perpetuating this exploitation having to live here three years and on a regular basis, but you still have to work. The feminine sector is responsible for that work due to the inviolability of the domicile. That's the only place that you can work safely because the labor inspectorate can't knock on the door and come in and check on the status of the situation. And so the Foreign Citizens Act has to be looked into as it is an accomplice to this feminine exploitation that we suffer in this sector. Thank you. And one final remark over here. My name is Heno. I'm from Valencia. I don't remember the person's name, but I could look them up when I go home. She's a Dutch anthropologist. She studied in Argentina. She lived in Argentina. And she has won the Prince of Asturias Award. Can everyone hear me? And when it comes to care work, she conceptualized the power of those who have no power. It was a concept uh, you're all talking about now in care and caregiving. She argued that they did have power because if it were to stop, if their work were to stop, it would stop a higher level of power. But they themselves do not have true power. I don't know if I've explained it clearly enough. Okay. 
Okay. I would take the liberty to add one more for Yayo in terms of the hegemonic narrative, the faith, this blind faith that technology is going to come and save us all. And how young people have this idea that any problem can be solved with technology. If we'd like to uh, begin by speaking to all these questions and remarks. Well, thank you uh, all for your contributions. I mean, it's not easy to say everything you want to say in 10 minutes, but we must also say that our bodies also speak. So when we don't specifically talk about uh, the law of uh, or the Spanish law on uh, aliens, I mean, the fact that I'm here speaking, that gives you the context. So, you know, you also have to assign the value or to what our bodies say, sometimes without words. And there you are, you know, that is uh, also the situation with the ILO. I uh, think that you know, the fact that we're here, that this is the success we've had with uh, this Spanish uh, law on migrant or foreign workers. So, yeah, I mean, obviously, we should have perhaps said that, but it's not easy to say everything you want to say in 10 minutes. And then on care work, as Malika was saying, when we provide care, we are sometimes left without that care. And you know, we need to think of that. We talk about public policies and the right to care, not just to any old care, but public community dignified care. I mean, we're not going to be happy with just any old care. We provide care and we need to start walking the walk to receive that care. And when we demand our rights, we demand our full rights. That's what we're talking about, Malika, and we're working on it. And then the whole organization we have and that we are working on is with those goals. And that's also, I mean, when we talk about feminist economy, that's, that's it. And finally, I want to say that, yeah, it's true that the bodies which are lately at the forefront of this situation is us, migrant people. But let's not forget what capitalism and patriarchy want us to forget. It's women. It's women who are fucked up, left, right, and center. Even if some of us have some privileges and others don't. But let's make no mistake, dear sisters. Yeah, recently the body is that of us, migrant women. But there were some other women before us. We've already heard that. Let's not forget. And what must be said to capitalism and to patriarchy and to this racist system is that women's life is at stake every day, is at risk. It is us women who have been who are suffering who are being raped and we need to change this capitalist racial system even if it is now us migrant women who are providing our body yeah it's all of our bodies one way or another and let's not lose sight of that because then there will be some of us on one side defending something which is the commons. Because we've been fucked up just because we're women. Bueno, eh, gracias por, por los comentarios y voy. Thank you for your comments. Just a couple of things. First, on what Mayo was saying. Um, the, the idea that, well, first, any work that generates data should have rights. 
and I, I go back to our colleague talking about riders. I mean, wh what used to be your CV is now up to the platform. We don't control it. You know, it is the property of the platform. So the whole discussion of talking about data as uh, common goods, well, for me, that would lead me to different places. First, how can we fight the sovereignty of data, the property of data, which has to have human rights assigned to it? And I'm going to stand up everywhere and say this because human rights are being threatened. And, you know, it's what we heard here and, and our Mexicans is said, the techniques of surveillance and permanent te techniques of, uh, you know, facial recognition data. Where does all that data go? Who handles it? That is strengthening criminalization dynamics, the criminalization of protests, of struggles, of uh, organized collectives. This is crucial. Then. We need to think that the aftermath of the pandemic has seen lots of discourses on economic recovery. You know, there is a European funds in Latin America we're hearing about the economic recovery, but that doesn't mean that there is more public investment. We need to see how we establish a link between common goods, common goods, data as common goods, and public investment in public digital infrastructure. There are lots of people who've been left out of the emergency package, at least in Argentina, because they couldn't have access to a computer where to load their data. I mean, this is basic, but also we need public digital infrastructure to manage that uh, process in health, in education, in reproductive rights, in social security, which is what is precisely in a crisis, social security systems. So we need to respond to this uh, paradigm of austerity, which is coming back. Oh, there is no money. Let's remember, we need to pay our debt. And we need to strongly support public investment in digital infrastructure. And now about what Begonia was saying about the uh, UN Commission on the status of women, the CSW in New York. Uh, I think, well, there are three things which are of concern. First, the Troy horse, the Trojan horse of PPPs, public-private partnerships. We see how those investments come from PPPs and the incoming private element is crucial. I mean, we see it in hospitals. When there is that partnership, the state ends up paying five or six times the price of paying for a hospital. We've seen that in South America. So the, these uh, partnerships in the digital world, they're not going to solve anything. How much is it going to cost us to sustain that? And then in the documents and executions, we see an absence of uh, responsibility and accountability from uh, digital companies. Who are they accountable to? What happens to profits moving from one place to another? They operate in this global south, but then the profit, the money goes to their HQs. That money, that accountability, that appears nowhere. Something else I'd say is a, a serious warning on anti-gender discourses in several discuss discussions and some positions held by some governments. And we see how in those discussions, when they talk about the digital inclusion of women, you know, that digital inclusion of women, uh, little girls, or just the digital inclusion of women, full stop, digital education doesn't go hand in hand with uh, comprehensive education, there are uh, conservative, uh, sexualized uh, discourses of education. Let's not lose sight of that. I mean, we can't uh, just say, let's include women. What do you want to include me in? I mean, what are we talking about? We don't want to have digital inclusion, for example, in programs for digital innovation paid for by the free market, which is a bit like 
a platform a bit like Amazon, which operates in Latin America. No, I don't want Mercado Libre to pay for the training of little girls in software coding. No, let's discuss that inclusion first. Tiziana, would you like to take the floor? I try to follow the discussion in Spanish because of the similarity with Italian, but I have to check some words sometimes, like I have to check los cuidados. <laughs> or I understand what it means now and why you know, it's important in this discussion. Well, I'm saying that uh, it's very difficult uh, to talk about, again, the commons in relation to the digital because of uh, a number of also technology in relation to feminist economy, because of a number of problems. On the one hand, the failure of digital commons, Wikipedia, open source, uh, to be a means to overcome uh, patriarchal and racial capitalism. It was, we can understand a bit why they did not start from uh, the premises, uh, the notion of digital commons uh, started from were mainstream economics. So information, as a commodity, as a non-rival commodity, and methodological individualism. So free individuals cooperate with free information to create the commons. So that way has failed. The digital commons have become part of the process of making money for big corporations, such as YouTube. And on the other hand, uh, we are not individuals, but we are formed by race, class, uh, gender, and that's how uh, why Wikipedia can become <laughs> misogynist and racist as well. So what if instead of starting when thinking about uh, technology and feminism, you know, uh, we, we uh, the commons, so we don't start from the digital commons, but we start from care, right, as we said. So as you said, the work of caring right now, it's uh, isolated, it's exhausting, it's continuous, uh, it's very low tech, is based on sexual and racial division of labor. Uh, in Italy, we talk about the model of one, one, one. One woman, uh, the carer, the square One woman, uh, the one who is taken care of, one house. You know, that is uh, a model of social isolation and exploitation. What if you could start from that and turn it, as we said, into social cooperative activity, which is replenishing uh, uh, where there is thinking and experimentation about how we take care of people and it's not the job of some hidden away to look after, you know, the ones who are vulnerable. The other question is solutionism. So technology is the solution to every problem, which is something that engineers do. So you leave it to the expert. How do you make uh, a technological innovation something that is uh, carried out uh, by a, a, a society, socially, you know, where uh, uh, people uh, can participate to uh, the development and invention of new kinds of technological interfaces. Uh, one that is based on recycling and not planned obsolescence, for example, of hardware. So, you know, you have these dangers, uh, you know, the fact the digital commons have failed, so maybe there can be no relation between the common and the, and the, and the digital. No, we have to rethink that and how you uh, have a social appropriation of technology which uh, can contribute to a feminist economy that is not solutionism. So it's not technology will find the solution. So public logic of investment, but with a new logic, because the, the logic of public investment until now has also worked you know, in ways that are not satisfactory. Uh, that is why, uh, you know, there's been uh, this conceptualization of common fair to argue for a different model of public welfare, uh, one which is based on participation no, and not on the division between the expert, the doctor, you know, who knows everything, for example, and the patient who just have to uh, accept the service. But how you to create uh, a learning community that also incorporates uh, technical uh, technical means. So this is that would be my answer. If I understood well, I've been trying to follow Spanish. Much. Thank you. Um, y para finalizar, Yayo. And to conclude now, Yayo. 
Yes, I would like to speak to three items that we have heard. One, I have not worked much on this, I must admit, but we need to engage in a dialogue to have a complex outlook on what we call digital commons. Anything that we call common, it happens with anything, foodstuffs, caregiving that involves bodies associated with it. But digital commons has a huge requirement for territory, a huge requirement for land of natural resources and bodies that live in those degraded territories that we cannot isolate it further by discussing it more if they're isolated. We can refer to commons that are sustained based on the deterioration of other more basic commons, those of the earth itself. Therefore, the discussion around digital commons must be associated with the idea of limits, physical limits and territorial limits. That would be my first thought. A second thought that I'd like to share as I listened to Florida's initial remarks, she brought up something that I've been concerned about for a long time and I think it is key. Is there a way to not occupy that space in social media, for example, that space where part of the policies and politics of social media are enacted, which I find very violent and very patriarchal to the point that we have some colleagues who have left social media as they were unable to stand the harassment, violence, insults that take place in those spaces. My feeling is that there's a certain reduction of media policy taking place through social media in which that velocity, that quickness, the hunt for likes and retweets end up creating something like a violent spectacle that does make for an increase in followers. I follow with an anthropological interest some of the great debates that have taken place online and sometimes the most violent person, when that person is called out after many uh, such episodes, they may say yes, but over the past few days I've gained 1,500 followers. And I'm concerned about that because it's like a way to capture time and we need to stop and think and deliberate and debate to solve a number of conflicts that are not easy to solve and to respond to the question that Astrid was asking. The patriarchal subject is one that is ashamed to live on earth, to say it one way. When we look at the Western patriarchism, this was born out of the rejection of human insertion, human integration on the planet Earth. It is a patriarchy that has learned to look at Earth and bodies from the outside, from a standpoint of superiority and one of exploitation, to submit it, to dominate it. And technology has been another arm of that, not all technology, but much of it and the main idea of technology has been the way to escape from those limits, to escape from the limits of the earth. We can't go back to the Francis Bacon period or the Newton period or some of the great fathers of that modern science that was born out of the Industrial Revolution but we could encounter this idea of escapist solutionism. That is the idea that technology is going to solve the problems that technology itself has caused. Look at Elon Musk with his proposal to escape to Mars or Jeff Bezos who has the gall 
to dress up like an astronaut and thank the employees of Amazon, thanks to them, thanks to their exploitation, he's been able to make his dream of being in space for 10 minutes come true. So we need a serious debate about technology. We do need technology, but technology in the service of life and technology that is a necessary condition for many things, but it is not enough on its own. Thank you to our four speakers. It's been a pleasure to listen to you.